Oh, hello, babe. It's been a while. It's been a while. Are you a member of my Patreon? If so, you can send me questions. Once in a while, once a year, twice a year, three times per year, whenever I feel like it, I will do an FHQ video where I answer the questions of my loyal patrons. There are people who donate to my channel and make it all possible. And today is another episode. Now, the first question is from a patron called Aiden. Aiden, thanks for your support. And above all, thank you very much for also being a long-term viewer and commenter. Aiden also has his own channel called Saturnit. Sometimes from time to time. I watch his videos and the things he does with moths. If you're interested, you should check it out. He sent me several questions. I apologize if it's windy. I hope it doesn't ruin the audio. Sometimes when the wind is blowing, it makes an ugly sound. Anyway, let's answer your questions today. The first question is, my favorite rearing experience. That's a difficult one, let me think. There's so many things I raised. There's three of them that really stand out in my memory. I don't think that I have a single favorite one. But a few years ago, I received eggs of a moth from Mexico that coincidentally also turned out to be a brand new species. I didn't get to name it because I was not the person who collected them. I'm just somebody raising the eggs. But it was called Paradirfia morula. And I just really liked the shape, the size and the color of the moths. I don't know why. But they have really colorful abdomens that are striped red and black and gold. And the wings are in contrast black. And I just really like the color combination of, you know, the, the black and red and yellow. It's just, I don't know, it has something really fancy. Another thing that I really liked was the breeding was going very well. I think I raised over 70 individuals on my first try, which was honestly amazing. There's a video about it on my YouTube channel. It was a, fl a day flying moth, uh, a Saturnid, a silk moth, from the highlands, high altitude in Mexico. And the moths were actually kind of small, but they were really cute, they were super hairy. What I liked about this rearing was several things. One, it had scientific value. It was a brand new species. So I was one of the first people to ever raise it. Number two, I just thought the moths were adorable and super gorgeous. I really liked the red colorful abdomen. I can't explain why. It's just something I think is really pretty. And three, it was very successful. And the fact it was challenging and successful did make it a happy experience for me. The caterpillars had like these venomous spines and they were red. I raised them on Willow. It's pretty cool. If you're curious, guys, check out the video on my channel. It's out there somewhere. And then there is another rearing that's very special to me. This rearing is so special that I traveled to Brazil specifically to breed this species. It's a species that very few people have ever raised. And all the people that raised them before me haven't documented it. So I was the first actually to document the whole life cycle. And being the first to raise something and being the first to document something is different. Because sometimes people will breed a really rare or unusual species, but they don't bother to take pictures or videos. And I guess that's because, well, now we're in a modern age of the internet where people document things extensively. Everybody has a smartphone and a camera. But like 10, 20 years ago, people didn't used to photograph or picture everything. The species is called the Black Witch. I'm sure you know it. And if you're a fan of my channel, I'm sure most of you have seen the video. What I really liked about this rearing was several things. First of all, it was really challenging. It was one of the most challenging things that I've done, to be honest. I really had to use all my knowledge and skills. It was like a true test of my ability as a breeder. Um, I had to discover it myself, how to breed this species in captivity. For example, I found out I was raising the caterpillars on Inga. 
a plant that grows in the rainforest, but I discovered the caterpillars only eat the young leaves. They would prefer to starve before eating the mature leaves for some reason, I don't understand why. Maybe the mature leaves are too tough for them to chew, or they have too little nutrients or too many toxins. Maybe the young leaf shoots, they are soft, they have a lot of sugar and nutrients, so they prefer eating the young leaves. So to breed these successfully, I had to grow a lot of saplings in the tree nursery. So basically, of all these saplings, they would strip all the young leaves, and then I had to replace them for new ones. It was very time consuming. So yeah, it's the fact that I really got to explore, test my ability as an entomologist, raise something really special that's raised by nobody else before. Well, that's not true. One of the first, not the first person. Um, I don't want to take too much credit. I'm not the first person who did it, but I'm still very proud that I documented the whole process. Nobody did that before. And to breed this species, I even had access to my own laboratory in Brazil and a research budget that allows us to grow the plants, you know. So I felt really professional, you know, for the first time in my, in my life. I was getting funding for research. I was getting a laboratory. I felt like a real entomologist. And then there's another reason why I really liked it. The species is really, really beautiful. There is one thing that you don't see if you see like the dead black witch moths in collections, but they tend to have a, a very purple violet kind of iridescence to them. And what's funny is if the moths die and you see them like in collections, for some reason they don't have the purple shine to them. I wonder why that is. I guess when the specimens get old, when the wings get old and faded, maybe somehow it disappears. It shouldn't because it's structural coloration. But I swear the live moths, they were much more colorful. You can see it in some of my videos where I film them under a certain angle. And if the light hits these moths from a certain angle, it's, it's like a purple emperor butterfly. You know, the black witch moth is actually surprisingly colorful. You know, when it's observed from a certain direction. And to be honest, they were gorgeous moths. They were really, really pretty. They were really beautiful and gorgeous. Um, it's a shame that most people don't have access to eggs or breeding material of this species. It's also a shame that they are so difficult to grow. Otherwise, it would be an amazing species for other hobbyists to raise in captivity. Because, my God, they are beautiful. And they live for a long time too. If you have a big space, they can live for several months. They feed on rotten fruit like banana, which I was feeding them, or sugar water. And it was an overall amazing experience. So yeah, that's some of my favorite breedings. One, the Smoky Emperor. Two, probably the Black Witch. Now I'm naming these in a random order, okay. It's not like in a particular order. I don't think I have a top favorite, but there's a lot of things that I like. Let's name five of my favorite breedings, okay? I'm gonna give you five of my best, my, my, my favorite memories that make me happy. I guess the third one that I would choose is one that I raised recently. It really looks like a polyphemus moth, but if you look closely, you will see some differences. One of my favorite species that I ever raised is a rare moth from Mexico. It's called Anterea Montezuma. And I think the moths, they are pretty. They are kind of like a fancy version of a polyphemus moth, if you catch my drift. But I also don't think that they're like super pretty. They're cool. It's like a polyphemus moth with a cool wing shape. Little bit more colorful, little bit more strange looking with these scalloped wings. But that's not the reason why I like them. The reason I like them so much was the caterpillars. Not because of the moths, but the caterpillars. Because, my God, they are so gorgeous. So the caterpillars of this Mexican emperor moth have these iridescent metallic patches that are pink and purple in color. And I'm going to tell you, my God, it's beautiful. Even the camera doesn't capture the beauty. Because in real life, it's just sparkly. It's almost iridescent. It's like they have this sort of silver, I don't know, it's like blue, silver, pink, purple 
depending on the angle that you're looking at it, but they are really, really, really shiny. And for me, this is one of those breedings that I really enjoy. Not because of the moths. I mean, the moths are cool. They are cool. But they're not, wow, mind-blowing. But the caterpillars, wow, they were to me, they were mind-blowing. I thought they were incredibly gorgeous. Super gorgeous. So that's probably one of my favorite rearings. If you, anybody watching this, you can get material of this species, breed it. You will not regret it. They are so beautiful. Especially the caterpillar. The only downside is it's not a species for beginners. Uh, it's a very challenging one. You need to be experienced to be able to raise them. I'm still breeding some, by the way. Maybe I should make a moth cycles, like a tutorial of them. If I'm confident in my ability to raise them, I will try my best. That would be very interesting. Thing is, I raised so many moths, it's hard to choose a favorite, you know. <laughs> There's hundreds and I love them all. I'm so passionate about it. So let's choose another favorite of all the moths I raised. Actually, recently I raised a really rare silk moth from California. It's very pretty, it's bright orange and it's endemic to Mexico and California. It's a pretty rare species. I'm sure you know what I'm talking about if you're into silk moths. It's Walter silk moth. Calo Saturnia Walterorum. Very pretty, very cute little species, very charismatic. But once again, what made this my favorite rearing was not the moths. Once again, the moths, they are pretty, you know, they are orange, it's very cool, they are cute. But they also live for a very short time and they are very neurotic. So it's hard to enjoy them. But what I really enjoyed is the caterpillars. In particular, the variation. They're like little jelly beans that come in a variety of pastel colors. Basically, there's a few basic color forms. One of them is like almost uh, lime, lime green. I think that's what you call it. Like it's almost fluorescent neon lime green. It's very beautiful. And then there is a color form that is almost like a carrot, bright orange. But it's, it's a very dark, almost brown kind of orange. It's a rusty kind of orange. And then also there is a yellow color form. That's just very bright yellow. It's like a lemon. And what was really cool is when I was raising them, I was lucky enough to have all the color forms. Some of these color forms are genetic. So if you have bad luck, all your caterpillars will be the green form or all your caterpillars are gonna be the orange or the yellow form, but not a combination. But I was lucky enough to have diverse genes in my breeding, so I had all the color forms at once. It was really pretty. Funny thing is the caterpillars can sting, and it's kind of painful actually. I didn't know that before I touched them. Found out the hard way. It's a beautiful species, but once again, I don't recommend this species for everyone, because it's very hard to raise, it's very challenging species. It's also a rare one. It's hard to obtain. But if you are confident in your ability, give it a try. They will not disappoint you. They are very nice. As you can see, most of my favorites are silk moths, except for the black witch. Black witch is a special place in my heart. It's one of my top favorites. Let's name another favorite breeding of mine. How can I forget the pink spirit moth? It's probably one of the most gorgeous species that I've ever raised. Uh, the males are bright pink with yellow. It's absolutely incredible to see these moths in real life. And the females, they are kind of like this mint green and bluish. And this is the kind of like a sexual dimorphism that you can see in many species of moon moths. It's not unusual to see this. But, man, seeing them in real life, it almost made me cry. They are wonderfully beautiful. I don't have words. Like, I could write poetry about it. They are so beautiful. And uh, I like everything about them. Their shape, their form. And what's cool is even the caterpillars are gorgeous. Like, this piece is beautiful in every life stage. The caterpillars have the, these bright blue tubercules on them. It's really something special. I haven't seen it yet on, uh, on many other species. 
Uh, but yeah, they are, they are just really gorgeous. And what's funny about the pink spirit moth is when it comes to breeding them, they're actually kind of easy to breed. They like a little bit of warmth and humidity, but on room temperature they were actually easy to rear, like any kind of moon moth. It was actually very similar to breeding the Luna moth, Actias Luna, which is a beginner species. And I think this, this species would be very popular in the pet trade. It would be very popular in the insect breeding hobby. If it wasn't for the fact that they don't really seem to be able to hibernate very well. The cocoons can hibernate on low temperatures, but if it gets too cold or they hibernate for too long, it will damage the development of the moth. So basically every winter, the species kind of disappears from the hobby, except in places where the climate is warm, where people can breed them all year. In Europe, the species vanished almost from the hobby after a few winters, because people could not breed them, you know, it's hard to find evergreen food plant for them. They'll eat smoke tree and sweet gum, which are not evergreen plants, unfortunately. So you have to war live in a warm climate to raise them all year or risk losing them in winter because they can hibernate, but their ability to do so is very limited. And it's also a rare species. Um, it's actually found in many countries in tropical Asia. I think like Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, China, maybe part of India. So there's many places where you can find it. But they are usually found in the mountains, in places where not many people moth trap. Also finding females is rare. The males will come to light in some places, but the females are kind of more rare to get in a moth trap. They're in remote places, in like subtropical humid forests in Asia, and there's just not that many people out there trapping moths all the time. And it's one of those uncommon to rare species that rarely enter the pet trade. Maybe every, every five to ten years they will be offered and people start breeding them, but then they kind of disappear from the pet trade, from the hobby again. So, um, yeah. I know the person who asked me this question actually tried to rear them. I'm uh, sorry it didn't work out. Hope you get another chance in your lifetime. I'm sure you will. You're young. You'll get another shot at breeding them. I'm very sure. And another honorable mention is the milky tiger moth, Aias galactina. Unfortunately, it's a species I raised a long, long time ago when I was a newbie, when I was a beginner, when I only had a few thousand subscribers. I have some lovely pictures of the insect and I guess I'll just display some of the pictures of these moths that I take myself. Yeah, they are my, these are my own pictures that I've made myself. I'll show them on screen so that you just can see how beautiful this insect is. It's honestly one of the most beautiful moths I've seen in my life. Maybe it's in the top five most awesome moths that I've ever seen. For me, it's the white and black pattern on their body and the red abdomen and like the golden, orange, reddish hind wings that are just a beautiful combination. Unfortunately, my footage of them sucks. I raised them many years ago. I think it must have been like 2017 or 2018. And back then I was such a small YouTuber. I didn't really have the budget to have a good camera or good camera equipment. Also nowadays, the quality of technology has gone up. Now it's easy to buy a cheap vlogging camera that films on high definition. But when I was younger, we had like these shitty digital camcorders. So my footage of these insects on my channel is uh, not really up to standards. I'm not really happy with the videos that I've made of them. If you're curious, you can look them up and you can see a younger, younger Bart Coppens uh, show you these moths on YouTube. These are probably my six favorite ones in no particular order. I'm not sure which one was my top favorite, but these were my best experiences so far. And I guess my most happy, my most favorite breedings. Another person asked me a question. One random species, well this is still Aiden by the way. Aiden sent me several questions. One random species you have been dying to rear that's from some random family, not Sphinx or Saturnidae. 
There's one moth I'm really obsessed with. And I, it's a very common species in Brazil. You can see them almost every day. It's one of the most common species there. And it drives me insane that the life cycle is completely unknown to science. It is Soscetra Ratra, Walker's moth. And the funny thing is, this mysterious moth, which belongs to the family of the Erebidae, is a very unusual species that morphologically stands out from the rest. And actually there is a small group of moths like these in South America. They also include the Emeraldine, um, Sterocena aminta, which is like a big green species that I'll display on the screen. It's also very common. And I've been talking to some researchers and they're thinking of making this group of moths their own new family. So you're, this is the first time you're hearing it. Stay tuned. So it's possible that these type of moths are going to be their own family in the future. Because to be honest, maybe putting them in Erebide was a mistake. They are morphologically really distinct. And what's funny is their life cycles are totally unknown. <laughs> I tried breeding them in Brazil. I haven't found any host plant yet. It's very hard to identify a random food plant in a rainforest. But next time I visit Brazil, one of the things I would really like to do is try to breed Walker's moth. Because it's such a common species, you see it there every time, every day, and it drives you insane, it drives you mad. How can something this common have an unknown life cycle? It's a mystery. I like to figure it out. So I'm kind of obsessed with them. There's also a lot of undescribed species, by the way. If you look online at the pictures of these moths from different countries, in every country they have like some different, different colors, different pattern and shapes. And they're all called Soscetra Grata, but there's many unnamed species of them that are waiting to be named. So that's a big mystery. That's one species I would really like to raise. But it's gonna be hard, no one has done it before. And to tell you the truth, when I was walking in the forest, I found a few trees with caterpillars on them. But the caterpillars were looking for a place to pupate. And they pupated, and they turned into a walker's moth. That's right. But I never seen them eat any of the leaves because they were pre-pupal, which means they were done feeding. But I actually have a suspicion of what could be the host plant. I'm not gonna share it, because if I share it, somebody else can steal my secret and do the research and do the life cycle that I kind of wanted to do. But I have a suspicion of what could be the food plant. But I gotta go back to Regua, I gotta go back to Brazil and have access to my breeding laboratory to be able to test my theory. I could be wrong. I would like to breed them. They are very beautiful. So who knows? Maybe, maybe one day, it could happen. And then Aiden asked me the hardest species that I've successfully raised. Hardest one, eh? That's hard to say because hard is relative, you know? What could be easy for me could be difficult for you. But what can be difficult for you could be easy for me. And because that depends on the climate that you live in. For example, if you live in a desert, in a dry climate, it's gonna be really easy to raise desert species. Like the Caletta silk moth, Upacardia Caletta, is a difficult species to raise if you are in a very humid environment. But if you live in a dry environment, they are very easy. So, and of course the plants you have available, if you live in the USA, species from the USA will be more easy for you because you have more access to local native food plant. Now here in Europe, I cannot get stuff like, I can't get milkweed for monarchs. I can't get button bush for certain silk moths. I cannot get bearberry like Arctospilos or Manazita for the Walter silk moth. So I'm missing a lot of the native food plant for species from different country. So yeah. If you're in Europe, raising species from Europe will be more easy. If you're from the USA, raising species from the USA will be more easy. 
So it's relative. That being said, the, what the most challenging species for me that I had success with is gonna be the black witch moth. The caterpillars were just very sensitive. I talked about it before, so I'm not gonna go in detail on them again. They are genuinely a difficult species. So anybody who manages to get eggs of this species and raise them into moths, and I mean like the whole life cycle from egg to moths to egg, get them to pair, to mate, do the whole life cycle, is very hard, it's very difficult. And I did it, so... Another honorable mention, and people are gonna laugh, is the robin moth, Hyalophora cacopia. It's probably these species I tried to raise the most amount of times and had the most amount of failure. I try to rear them again almost every year and almost every year I fail to raise them. Which is funny because some people can raise them without any effort. I don't understand. A friend of mine actually started this hobby recently and it was one of the first pieces that he ordered online. And he successfully raised like uh, 40 caterpillars. I was like, how? I'm trying to raise it for like 10 years. This freaking moth. I raised hundreds of species in my life, I'm experienced, but I cannot raise the species that a beginner can raise. I just don't understand, it's a mystery. There must be something in my environment that they don't really, really don't like and I still have to figure it out. It's so weird. Last question from Aiden. What is the most important thing that you've done in your career? Well, that's a difficult question, you know. It's a difficult question because my career doesn't have any big wins. In fact, my career is an accumulation of small wins. I make a lot of videos on YouTube, for example. I write a lot of pages on my website. But none of these pages and none of these videos really defined my success. All of them got like a small amount of views and subscribers. But when you add it all up, that's where my success comes from, really. So it's actually hard to say the most important thing that I've done. Because I've actually done... I've done a lot of small things instead of like a few big things, you know. So I leave it up to you guys to decide what the most important thing is that I've done. I don't really know. Next question is from Abigail. And she asked me, okay, for real. How helpful is it to raise an indigenous species of moth or butterfly to release in its own area? It's not helpful. It's not helpful at all. Rearing and releasing or breeding butterflies and moths does absolutely nothing to help the environment. They don't need, they don't need our help to survive and reproduce. See, the reason why butterflies and moths are declining and the reason they are threatened is because people destroy their homes, okay? We make our gardens tidy, so there's no, no flowers in there. You know, butterflies need flowers, they drink nectar. They need food plants to lay eggs on. If you remove those and make a boring lawn or garden, you're wiping out all the local species. Of course, there's deforestation, people cutting down the trees, creating pastures, orchards, you know, agriculture. There's the pesticides that we spray. There's a lot of insect control programs, like spraying against the gypsy moth, kills many other species of butterflies and moths, you know, climate change is threatening them. But breeding and releasing them is not going to change that situation, you know. It's not going to help. It's kind of like throwing ice cubes on a melting glacier. First of all, their insects are so numerous in the environment. There's billions and billions and billions of them. You raising 10 or 20 or even 100 butterflies is probably not going to make an impact. Even on a rare species. Secondly, butterflies and moths in the wild have a high mortality rate and that's a good thing. Nature only selects the strongest ones. The weak ones don't survive. But in captivity, they have a higher survival rate. So the ones with a bad immune system, 
or the ones who are weak may survive and you're releasing them to possibly pollute the gene pool. So there's a lot of things that can actually go wrong when you breed and release them that doesn't really help them. Second of all, you're flooding the environment with a lot of individuals. The environment regulates how many individuals of one kind of animal are allowed to survive, right? It's based on how much food and space there is available. Imagine there is a village and the number of people in the village is going down because there's not enough food for everyone, right? There's, there's a thousand people in a local village and these people, they live near a lake and they're all fisher, they, they all eat fish from the lake. Yeah, that's their sustenance. Now imagine something happens, you know, the fish get sick and they die and there's not enough fish to feed the local people. And suddenly the population in the fisher, fisher people village, it goes down from a thousand people to 100 people. Because 900 people starve. There's not enough fish to feed everyone anymore. So the population goes down, it adjusts itself to what's proportional to the availability of their natural resources and the food. Now imagine what happens if I, if I go back there and I, I release a thousand new people to replenish the population. What's going to happen? People are going to suffer more, they're going to starve more. You're just adding more people on top of the problem. You know, more individuals doesn't help the systematic issue. And the systemic issue is we are destroying the forest, we are destroying nature, we are destroying their home. But it's, they, don't, they don't have problems creating offspring, they lay thousands and thousands of eggs, you know, um, more than enough. They don't need us to rear them in captivity and release them, it's not going to work. The only way to help them is to restore the environment. Next question is by Freya and she asked me around how many species of moth have I raised like ever? Well, I'm sorry to say I never kept a list. I don't really count how many species I've raised, I'm sorry. But I have had to make an estimate. I would say it's around four to five hundred species. Something like that. But I'm gonna keep it real. I could be wrong. I don't exactly know. And then there is somebody called Pazuriel who asked me, have you ever breed Antocaris cardaminis, which is the orange tip butterfly? The answer is no, I haven't, unfortunately. I've been doing this hobby for how long? 12, 13 years. And I still haven't raised all the common species for one reason. <laughs> There's too many of them. There's hundreds of species in this hobby. If you're doing moths and butterflies, then there's even more, which is what I am doing. I'm not only doing moths, but I'm doing moths and butterflies. So, oh. If I ever get to the point where I even raise all the basic and common species, it could take 10 more years for me to do that. There's just too many. There's too much in this hobby. Because insects are so diverse. I would like to do the orange tip one time. It's not on top of my priority. Maybe one day. They're a cute species. And then there's a question from Jan Rumanx. Next time you do a question and answer video, I'm wondering how you came to master the English language. You not only know how to speak correct grammar, but also our slang and idioms. Great job, however you did it. I love the beautiful moths you show us. I am learning so much. Well, thank you for your compliment. How I learned English is actually a complicated story. So first of all, I live in the Netherlands, yeah? And the Netherlands is a very small country in Northern Europe. What's funny is, despite being a very small country, there's still um, a population of 18 million people, last time I checked. 18 million people is not a lot, but it's more than you expect for the size of the country. And that's because it's very densely populated. It's a small patch of land, but there's a lot of people in this small space. But the problem of being a small country is that if you only speak native language, your options are going to be very limited. If you want to do business, you want to be able to do business with other countries because your country is small. So, in the Netherlands, English is mandatory at school and that definitely helped. That's right, every Dutch person 
Apart from the native language, every Dutch child at school has to learn basic English. Of course, this is very basic English and it doesn't make you as proficient as I am, I suppose, and most people aren't. But it helps, you know, there's a culture here of English. The movies here are in English, they are not dubbed. They just broadcast them in English with subtitles, so yeah, there's a lot of English media here. Which is another way that I learned to speak English, so I guess number one is school. Number two is movies and video games. I think that's how many kids in Europe and other countries around the world learn English. Because they play video games online and they start chatting with people online. You know, and that's when you start to experience... I don't know, when I was young I was like a fan of movies like Lord of the Rings. I was addicted to a video game called RuneScape, which I played for years. I was addicted to it. And um, when I was young, I played a game called Fallout 3. There's a lot of games that I used to play when I was younger. For a short time, I was also in World of Warcraft, believe it or not. Even as a child, I played a lot of RTS games like Tiberian Sun, Red Alert 2, and even Pokemon when I was very young. And all these video games and media, they influenced my mind. And from a very young age, started to pick up some English words. So reason one, school. Reason number two, media, culture, video games, movies. And then there's a reason number three. Can you guess it? It's you, it's the internet and YouTube. If you go to my older videos, some of the oldest ones that I uploaded, you can notice that first of all my accent was much stronger. By all means I still have a very strong Dutch accent, but it's becoming a little bit more English over time. If you go to my oldest videos, let, let's see how I'm talking. So, hi everyone, this is me. Uh, for the first time I'm actually uploading a video which includes myself. Uh, why? It's because I want to talk about my one of my uh, particular interests, which is one uh, family of insects called the silt moth, also known as Saturnidae or Saturnids. They are these kind of moths. Saturnidae is a moderately large family with about uh, 2,000 described species. But yeah, that's that's noticeably different, isn't it? And it's also the fact that I am a part-time YouTuber, so every week I'm talking in English, I'm making recording videos, speaking in English, and every time I make one of these videos, I have to pronounce more words and my pronunciation starts to improve. So yeah, it's school, video games and movies, the internet and YouTube, social media. And there's also a secret fourth reason. The fourth reason is traveling. As you see on my channel, nowadays I spend a lot of time in foreign countries. 2090, somebody gave me a job in Cambodia and Laos. I worked there for a butterfly farm and it forced me to speak English to the people around me. Then I went to Brazil. I'm sure some of you have seen the videos. Uh, I spent a total amount of time of six months in the country of Brazil and I plan to go back. Yeah, in Brazil they, sp they speak Portuguese, not English. But actually I don't know Portuguese, so I'm forced to speak English. Because after Portuguese, some of the Brazilians know English. Not all of them, but like the scientists do and the people that help me, the tour guides know English. So in foreign countries I speak a lot of English. Recently I went to Uganda, Africa. And guess what? People there also speak a lot of English. Um, it's actually one of the official languages of Uganda is English. It's a complicated situation because Uganda has many indigenous languages actually. The main one is called Luganda, but there's also many different ones. I think there's like, I don't know, up to like 20, 30? I don't even know how many indigenous languages there are. But because all these people also have different indigenous languages, there's also a few generic ones. These are Swahili, Luganda and English. If you speak English in Uganda, you can talk to most people. And it's just also my general travel experience. So yeah, it's these four things combined that make me 
somewhat proficient. Yeah, and then there's also higher education. I did go to college and university at some point in my life where I had to learn scientific English. And I've always been somewhat good with language. So those are some of the reasons really. And then there's somebody who asked me, are you still looking for people to go to the Amazon? Yes and no. My problem is budget. See, I was planning to go to the Amazon this spring, but unexpectedly I was invited to Uganda. And then I went to Uganda and I spent all my money there, you know. If I could afford to go to the Amazon, I would. And I would take people with me who want to travel with me. But at the moment I just can't afford it. But in my lifetime I really want to see the Amazon, and when I do, maybe I'll post a message online, maybe people want to join me. That's really the problem with traveling. I really have the motivation to do it non-stop, full-time, if it was up to me. I would be in the rainforest half the time and not in my home country, the Netherlands. I would just be traveling the world, documenting rare species. But um, life gets in the way. There's work, there's studies. Flight tickets aren't free, they're expensive, you know. So yeah, I'm, uh, that's not a lifestyle that I can afford at the moment, uh, but it's, it's up in my to-do list. Maybe one day if I save money, I'll go to the Amazon. It was my plan, but then my plans changed. Somebody invited me spontaneously to Uganda. I took the opportunity, but because of that, I didn't go to New York. I wanted to go to New York and then French Guiana, actually. That was my original plan. But my plans changed. You can't predict life. Anyway, thanks for sending me questions. If you are a Patreon member of mine, you can inbox me with your questions. Next time I do an FHQ, I'll make sure to include them. Hope you guys found this enlightening. See you next time.